Hi, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Love Your Work. I'm Whitney Wiley, and today I have with me Andrea Hall, who is going to share with us some of her journey to work that she loves. She's a recovering lawyer. <laughs> I love recovering lawyers, being one myself. And she does some gestalt therapy with horses, so equine gestalt therapy. So I just want you to sit back, relax, and uh, listen to the wisdom that Andrea is going to share with us. How are you doing today, Andrea? Thank you. I am well. I'm glad to be here with you today. It is an absolute pleasure to have you. And so um, why don't we start with just understanding a little bit about what it is you're currently doing, and then we'll take some, a trip down memory lane. <laughs> Great. So I currently am wanting to leave my law practice sooner rather than later, yet uh these times um, are a little uh, crazy right now. So that is what is paying the bills. However, my dream job would be for me to specifically work with the horses full time. That's really where my passion is right now. And I just want to be able to help people in a different venue than I have yeah. for the last 17 years. Yeah. as well as get off the hamster wheel and being in that fight or flight mode. Um, you know, when I'm in the courtroom, because I've been a trial attorney for 16 years, I my heart rate goes up, my breathing pattern mm. changes, my voice goes up three or four octaves, and I'm just like, ah, you know, and I come home and my husband's just like, how was your day? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, and so it's like, when I'm out with the horses, like my world disappears. Mm -hmm. I can relax and I'm in the present moment and I just am breathing peacefully and I'm not checking my calendar and my cell phone. I just, in fact, was on vacation and had some stuff blow up before I left. And the whole time I was on vacation, I was looking at emails and checking my phone and I was like, this was supposed to be so relaxing. <laughs> However, you know um, that in the legal world, stuff can go south very quickly, right? Yeah. And yeah. so someone's four alarm fire now all of a sudden becomes yours. <laughs> that, that is very true. And so it, it, you're the pre-recovering lawyer, I guess it was a better <laughs> way to put that, right? An aspiring, an aspiring recovering lawyer. So yeah. tell us about what this gestalt therapy is that you do and how you include the horses as part of, of your work. Yeah, so I honestly think the horse is the best part of it. They guide me through the process of questions to ask based mm. on their behaviors what the client is feeling in the present moment as a result of being in the horse's presence. So horses are attracted to truth. And when someone is in their truth and speaking their truth, the horse really wants to join up with that. So I call them my lie detectors and I would put them up against any trained FBI agent any day of the week because what happens is when you're speaking your truth and you're in alignment, energetically, the horses can feel that. Mm. So it's not a matter of you saying, um, so let me give you an example. I put you in the round pen you happen to have on a black shirt today. And I say, what color is your shirt? And you say, my shirt's red. That energetically is not the truth. And obviously it's, more in depth than that right like if i say how do you like your job or what's going on in your job consciously someone may say oh it's great yet subconsciously mm -hmm. they're they're not in a great place and they're miserable and they want to leave yet the fear of leaving that is yeah. greater than the fear of being in a place of misery and that's you know something that happens with you know, people who are in situations of abuse and domestic violence, 
the fear of leaving right. is greater than the fear of, I know I'm going to get the tar beat out of me. He's going to come home and drink a six pack and then he's going to smack me around or what's going to set him off today. Right. Because if they leave it's how am I going to pay my bills? Where am I going to live? Right. Our money is commingled. We have kids, you know, the list goes on and on. And that happens in the legal profession all the time. People are miserable. Their hair is on fire yet they're like, how do I leave? I have student loans. We have kids in um, private schools. We have a mortgage. I have student loans. I mean, the list goes on and on right. of reasons why. And some of that identity, blame. the identity is tied up in that and the prestige of, of that position or the power in other things. So yeah. And, yeah. And that yeah. is huge because you know, when you walk into the room and somebody asks what you do and you say, you're a lawyer, all of a sudden the C parts, right? right like, right. Oh, you've arrived, right? And I remember going through that and my family members saying to me, you're going to leave the, the legal profession? And I said, yeah. And they're like, why? You spent so many years to get there in education. And I was like, yes. However, it's physically killing me. And what's your life worth to you? right? Right. So yes, I can stay here and be miserable because it's a nice profession and people think it's great, but the people that are actually in it, living it every day in the trenches, yeah. yes, there are plenty of people that love what they do. Don't get me wrong, but it is a very stressful um, yeah. career yeah, and it yeah. is not easy on people. I mean, we're like the number 11th profession when it comes to drug and alcohol abuse right when it comes to suicide so even though we're in you know a $500 Armani suit when we walk into court how many people are popping pills drinking um you know beating the tar out of their wife cheating trust accounts are out of whack not communicating with clients right. I mean the list goes on and on right and then for okay. each one of those in a $500 or a $2,000 Armani suit you know pulling down five, six hundred dollars an hour, there are those who are struggling, right, to keep a door open or to have their phone still turned on. So it, it it's not the glamour um, profession that TV generally makes it out to be. Yes, yes. And I think there are some types of lawyers that are very glamorous, you know, oh, if you're, sure. um, you know, doing white collar crime or, you know, or entertainment law, right? <laughs> yeah, some of those are great, right? Um, but for me being in the trenches with clients who are accused of sex assault and domestic right. violence and drugs, that's not always easy. I mean, we're fighting not only the cops, but we're fighting the, pro the prosecutor and the government. And so it's a constant this, you know, the only emotion that's typically had in the courtroom is anger because someone generally, both sides typically are not happy. You right. know, we're trying to find something that both people can swallow the pill. Um, but, you know, if we lose in trial, then my client's mad. If we win in trial, then the victim or the prosecutor is mad and the police. And, you know, so it's not a, a profession where you're typically high-fiving strangers. <laughs> no, but, but the horses are a whole other story. Yes. Yes. They're, they're my, I, they're really what got me to take the plunge and say I was going to leave my law practice mm. because I had been physically ill. Uh, I was in the middle of a five-day jury trial when my 18-month-old puppy passed away. And after that, I said, what am I physically killing myself for? Because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, I don't get baby announcements. Nobody sends me Christmas cards. Hell, I'm lucky if they pay their bill. You know, like, I was like, what am I doing? Because at the end of the day, if I'm not happy, this is not worth right. it in the end. And so I stepped away from my practice and took the summer off. And I realized how physically stressed my body was because when it was time to actually go back to work at the end of the summer, I went, I don't know if I can do this for the rest mm, of my life. Yeah. And that's really when I started to notice my body having a physical reaction. And about that time, I started also getting physically ill. I was having headaches. 
and they just kept getting closer together and staying longer. And I was passing out and we couldn't figure out what was going on. And so I finally, after doing all of the natural things I could, like Reiki and acupuncture and um, cranial massage and changing diets and food and whatever, I went to Western medicine and I said, I, I need some help. I need some answers. And so um, I was told at that point in time, basically, there wasn't anything neurologically the matter with me. And they could do an MRI, but they didn't think it was going to show anything. And so at that point in time, I said, well, why would I spend $5,000 if it's not going to show anything? So I left. However, six weeks later, it got to the point that I knew that I had to find an answer. So then, of course, we fought with the insurance company because they don't want to concede and do anything, right? Right, right. So yeah, we fought with them for about six weeks uh, until they finally agreed to an MRI after I went to physical therapy and they could do nothing for me. In fact, they did dry needling on me and sent me into an utter tailspin. And I said, I'm never coming back. Um, and intuitively, apparently I already knew because I said to the insurance company, I'm going to add you to the list of people I sue when you find out I have a brain tumor and you're sending me to physical therapy. Oh my God. And so sure enough, I had the MRI and within 20 minutes of leaving the facility, they called me and said, you have, or, I mean, the, the doctor's office uh, called and um, said, you need to get in right away. And I was like, well, I'm busy, you know, I have a full day, <laughs> what's going on? And I knew when he refused to speak to me on the phone that there was a major problem. Mm. So we um, got in front of a brain surgeon and uh, got a second opinion. And sure enough, I had to have surgery. And I got a Christmas miracle that year. It was not cancer and it was not benign. So, or I mean, it was benign. Um, so I, um, you know, was blessed. And I knew at that point in time that if I got a second bite at the apple, that I was going to do the second half of my life much different. And it's definitely been a process. It's not easy um, right. to leave, you know, something that's lucrative to jump off and start a new business. And if you are a business owner, it's not easy whatever profession you're right, in right. attempting uh, a new business. Yet this is definitely something that is out of the ordinary. So many people deem coaching as something that's not a necessity and that they can put that on the back burner. And I guess I have always been a firm believer in a coach. I have a coach most times in my life because a coach sees you bigger than you see yourself right, right? and helps you get over the obstacles because we should on ourselves on a daily basis yeah. and we put ourselves last on the list. I mean, you know, if you're married or have children, you know that your priorities typically come to the end of the list and they may never get addressed, right? How many moms or wives come home and cook dinner for their husband after their husband has already worked out for the day, has gone to work and done what he wanted. Like, I don't know any man that says to their buddies, you know what? I got to go home and help my wife do laundry today. So I'm going to pass on going out for a beer after work, right? right. No man ever. <laughs> but a woman walks in and goes, oh my God, the dog threw up. This laundry needs to be put away. What about supper? Pick up your shoes. You know? A right, laundry list right. of things where a man comes home and is like, hey, what's for dinner? You know, the bomb could have went off around them and they don't see anything. And you're like, hello. <laughs> no, you're you're absolutely right. And the, the, the concept that having someone help you, and I love the way you put that, see yourself bigger than you see yourself. Um, you know, having someone to walk the journey with you, you know, we think it's okay to, to see coaches for sports figures, but in other areas of life, we don't see that so much. It's like, well, if a sports figure needs a coach, uses a coach, 
then why wouldn't you? You're, you're living your life just as much as they're living their life, right? Or you're in your profession and, and could use the same sort of help to help you maximize to be the best in your profession that you can be. So um, I love the way you put that. So how did you, I, I'm just so interested in understanding how you've married the two is, is I don't, I've never heard of equine, you know, being a gestalt equine coach. Um, so is this something you created or was, is this actually out there? And yeah. um, wh whoever designed it, how do you think they come to marry the two? And I get the, the truth detector part and, and the, the emotions with the horses, but still to, you know, can I, ma can I marry apple pie with coaching and see how that gets people to respond? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So Curious. during the three years before I found out I had the tumor, I was on this soul searching journey of mm -hmm. figuring out what mm -hmm. I was basically going to do when I grew up. And so I started searching and I had always been involved in the coaching industry. Okay. Um, so I started searching out other things that I could do. And I mean, I went from being a lobbyist to um, other areas of law. Like I searched everything that mm -hmm. I could possibly mm -hmm. do. And I had a friend actually introduce me to someone that did a different modality of what I do. And when I went to the barn and had the experience, I went, oh my God, this is the ticket. Like I can take my love for horses and combine it with my ability to help people just in a different arena. Because as a, as a criminal defense attorney, I help people all the time, right? right. And I'm right. constantly coaching my clients off the cliff, right? <laughs> like what to say at a sentencing or how to right. justify, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And so... I then started looking after I had that experience myself with um, someone in the industry, I started looking at who I could train with. And I ended up finding uh, Melissa Pierce who owns Touch by a Horse. Okay. And like I said, she combines the horses with the Gestalt technique. And so Gestalt is a German word that means wholeness and it's a therapeutic technique that's used by therapists. However, you don't have to be a therapist in order to use the technique. Mm, okay. So I went through a two year certification with her on training just specifically the Gestalt work with the horses. I just recently did another two year training with her specifically just with the Gestalt. So I have four years of training in the Gestalt method. So I have way more training in Gestalt than any therapist does, unless they're a Gestaltist okay. doing that specifically in a therapeutic uh, realm. And so basically I now get to help people in a different arena than in the criminal justice system. And don't get me wrong, the criminal justice system needs lots of work because I, yeah. you know we put a Band-Aid on a wound that needs staples and a tourniquet because it's all about the money. It has nothing to do with rehabilitation and mm -hmm. getting people out of the system. Right. right. We'd much rather spend forty, fifty thousand dollars and put someone in, you know, an eight by eight cell on a cot and give them three meals a day than spending forty thousand dollars and sending them to a rehab facility. Because when they're in jail, they never get to the root of the problem. And anybody can stay sober in jail because you have no real world going on around you. Right. And not right. only that, there's more drugs in jail than there is out on the streets, but they can stay sober if they want to there because they don't have the stress of a job. They don't have a stress of a girlfriend. They don't have stress of life, kids, whatever, um, putting a roof over their head, finding a place to live because they're a convicted felon. How do I find a job now? Cause I'm a convicted felon. So when they come out and they have no tools to be successful, like how to, how to put a resume together, how to find a job, how to keep a job, how to pay bills, right? And most drug addicts either have a mental health problem 
or some trauma that they sustained and they never healed the trauma. So when they get back out in life and they get triggered, because they're going to get triggered again, and they send them right back to the same environment right. that they got in trouble in. So all of the triggers that got them in trouble are right there in their face again. What do they think? They're going to end up doing the same things they did before. Use, sell, turn a trick, whatever, because that's what they do. That's all they know. They don't know anything different. And so I would love for it to be in the criminal justice system. But, you know, unfortunately, that doesn't feed the government. <laughs> right. Right. So uh, walk me through or walk us through sort of a, a down and dirty of how you use the horses um, and, and do a typical session with a client. Sure. So a session is first the client just coming and getting into the, the present moment because we are so run by our cell phones and our calendars mm -hmm. and email that it's just getting the client quiet so they can actually feel into their body. What is their body and their heart wanting to share at that moment in time? And then we go from there. Um, just whatever's coming up and work through it. You know, in a typical session, my client leaves after an hour and a half to two hours looking like they've had a facelift or lost 150 pounds because they come to a realization and typically have had some sort of aha moment mm -hmm. that they go, wow, that's what's been keeping me from moving forward in life. Or now I know when that feeling comes up in my body, where it's coming from and why it's stopping me and how I can work through that out in the real world and it not keep me stuck. Right. And, you know, just being in the horse's presence is healing in and of itself. You know, I have seen so many people just go stand on the fence line with horses and just watch how they shift and change just being in the horse's presence. Because the horse energetically will pull from you what you don't need. Mm. And they'll... I call, we call it leeching in my world. So it looks like a horse is yawning, right? Horses don't have the ability to throw up. That's why they colic because their intestines don't have the ability to get rid of what's going on like we humans do or a mm. dog. Okay. And so when a horse is pulling from you, they will look like they're yawning and they're expelling the energy that is not needed on you and balancing you and getting you back into alignment and healing you just by being in their presence. And, you know, I've had the experience where I thought I was fine and I go out to feed or just be with the horses, groom them, you know, do whatever. And I find myself bawling, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. where did that come from? And it's not that it's good, bad, right or wrong. It just is. And it was a release that was necessary. And the horses brought that up, you know, had I been at home, probably wouldn't have happened, you know, yet it's being with them and actually in the present moment that they draw those emotions out and the healing begins. This is so interesting. I love horses. I don't have any horses. Unlike you, I don't have eight horses. Um, <laughs> I don't live on a ranch yet. It yeah. is part of the plan. Yeah. Um, but it, it is so interesting because, you know, that I've got um, friends who have a couple of horses, their daughter is a jumper. Um, mm -hmm. and every time I go out to watch, um, I, it's just a whole other vibe, right? And, and I can feel just being in the presence, um, and I haven't, we haven't done any therapy with the horses or anything, but I certainly can, can imagine myself having some of those transformations that you're talking about, just being in that environment. So do people who come to you come also with a love of horses or does it not matter? Can, can you be someone who's never seen a horse, been around a horse, or even maybe be afraid of a horse and still come and benefit from what you do? 
yes, I have all walks from people who ride, um, you know, and have their own horses to people who are scared. Um, okay. And, you know, it's that connection that happens with a 12 or a 1500 pound animal mm -hmm. that is so amazing. And so if a client is super scared of the horse, we can do the same work with them on the outside of the round pen. They don't okay. physically have to go in the round pen with the horse because the horse is healing from energetically. It's amazing because I never use, well, I shouldn't say I never because obviously I have seven and so they do get used regularly, but I don't typically go out and pick the horse. Okay. I go out and say, I have a client coming today who's ready to work and the horse decides who's going to work. Wow. Um, and intuitively it has never failed me. You know, the stuff that gets drawn out and even in groups, people all the time, especially like the first one that goes, mm -hmm. they're like, Oh, this is trained. Right. And by the time the second or the third one goes and you start hearing the feedback, they go, well, it didn't do that with me. And I said, that's because they're not trained they do what is necessary for the client and yes they all have personalities and yes they all do things that are a little bit different yet i have no control over what they're going to do what they're going to draw out and what's going to happen with the client you know clients can all of a sudden get in the round pen and go god i feel like i'm gonna vomit and i'm they were like fine five minutes ago and so it's like, okay, what's coming up for you now here in this moment, you know, I've got pain in my shoulder, you know, okay, let's work through that. What's going on? What's coming up for you? Um, you know, I just realized I'm five years old and I'm standing in the kitchen hearing my dad say, if you don't get it right, someone's going to die. Mm. And they go, every time I go to take a step forward in my business, subconsciously, that's what I hear that's what's been holding me back. Wow. And so it's, I'm not five, you're not five and no one's gonna die. Someone might have died on that conversation you heard because your dad was a brain surgeon. That conversation is not relevant to you as a mediator. No one's gonna die. Someone may lose some money, but no one's gonna die if you don't get that mediation right, you know? Yeah. So it's things like that that were traumatic that you may not even have realized. You took an incident that affected you based on your age, who you heard it from, what happened, that may not have affected the same person next to you the same way, right? Right. Because right. you can talk to five kids in a family when a major event happened, a death, right? I lost my dad when I was 17. How I experienced the loss of my dad at 17 was completely different than how my brother who was nine and my brother who was um, 15 experienced. Right, right. You know, I remember my 15 year old brother going, uh, can we go back to school? Because it was all about him. My nine year old brother, because he was nine in his age of development was all about his outside world and not what was going on here now in the present moment, right? So everybody experiences things different depending on your age of development and who it's coming from. Yes, right. And an ounce of pain is an ounce of pain. You don't have to have been beaten, sexually assaulted, came from a divorced family, drug addiction, alcohol, cheating. I mean, that's not what my definition of trauma is. I mean, cause still to this day, the reason I went to law school instead of med school was because I can remember in third grade standing next to my chair, having to do flashcards and wanting to vomit. I mean, even now somebody talks about math and I'm like, no, nope, no, I'm not good at math. Could you find somebody else? <laughs> you know, and I'm 47, you know? So it's things like that that people don't even realize. I mean, right. had that not happened to me, I may have went to med school and I could be a doctor instead of a lawyer. 
and oh. you, you would probably still be looking to be doing gestalt <laughs> coaching with equines because it's another one of those professions that is highly stressful and and all that other stuff so that's that's really kind of interesting because i was going to ask you um next as we start down sort of this memory lane is how you came to choose the law um and if it was your fear of math <laughs> you know and, and and not wanting to push down medical school um what was you know, whether that is wholly the the reason or not but what was the reason you chose law and then why the particular law that you chose sure so um i think part of why i chose law school was that i didn't have to do math yet i loved to debate and argue okay. um i was told from a very young age, I talk too much. Um, in fact, that was always on my report card. She just doesn't shut up. <laughs> um, and I love to argue. Um, and so I think those were some of the things I had always been very dominant and strong willed. And um, that was, I think, something that came very easily to me. I am the first one in my family on both sides that uh, went to college for four years, as well as the first one to get an advanced degree. Mm -hmm. So I'm the first generation of that. So I didn't have anyone to like follow, you know? Um, it wasn't like my parents pushed me into that because a lot of times that's what happens. Families have lawyers and doctors and so they pigeonhole you into that. My parents were, you know, just do whatever you want to do and they were fully supportive of that. Um, as far as, um, I guess that was the biggest probably reason why I, um, chose that. And I forget the second part of your question. No, it's just what, why litigation? Oh, was. yes. And then because so, you also had mentioned that, you know, as you were struggling with your health, you looked into some other areas of law. Why not something else? So I always wanted to be a trial lawyer. That's okay. where my passion lies. Um, in fact, that's the biggest thing I'm probably going to miss when I leave the practice of law. If I could just step away and not have any of the before or after drama and somebody just said, here's the case, prep it, get ready for trial. And that's all you have to do is trial work. I think I would probably stay because mm -hmm. I love the trial work. I love figuring out who's the jury and who's ultimately going to be my foreman and who's going to be the weak ones that the foreman will be able to flip. And, you know, are they a thinker or are they a feeler? What's going to happen when they get in the jury room? Um, and, you know, getting witnesses on the stand and all of a sudden they say something you've never heard before. And that part, has always been juicy to me. Mm -hmm. um, I chose the criminal arena because I had an undergraduate degree in criminal justice. I actually had originally wanted to go work for the FBI and I was in a horse riding accident. And after the accident, I had lost motion in my arm and knew that I would not be able to do the physical regimen to get through at Quantico. I had worked out in Washington, D.C., and so I was close to Quantico, so I had already been to the facility, and that was the first path that I had planned on taking. However, after the horse riding accident, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do that. So while I was in law school, I clerked for a uh, very prominent criminal defense firm in the area where I went to law school in Grand Forks. And I just loved it. And then when I got out, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And most places don't specialize just in, in criminal defense. And if they do, they're just a small practice, right? And so I couldn't find a job. So after a year of looking for employment after I passed the bar, 
I said, well, I guess I'll open my own law practice. I'm not sure who does that, but okay. So I got my malpractice insurance, hung a shingle, and started taking cases that the other lawyers in town didn't want to take at a very low rate. And they fed me cases and I would go to court and pray they didn't call my case first. And then I would get up and regurgitate what I just heard someone else say. And I really faked it till I made it. And uh, 16 years later, I must have been doing something right. Oh, I, I, I love the, the fact that there are aspects of what you do that you love. And it is always interesting that there, the things that we don't like about the job somehow overtake the pieces that we do. And then it becomes necessary to step away from that. And, and certainly when what you're doing impacts your physical, mental, emotional health, you have to take notice, right? And, and make some decisions of how to make changes. So I, I commend you for that part. And, um, but at the same time, I'm thinking, and maybe it isn't possible. <laughs> you say it, I'd like to think, you know, because I'm a believer that you can really kind of structure things any way you want, that there has to be a way Maybe I'm just wishful thinking. There has to be a way for you to run a practice, have people around you that, or step into a situation where you're the person who just shows up and maybe that's TV, right? Maybe that's just <laughs> on TV. That's what I'm thinking is TV. That you could just show up and go to court and not do any of that other stuff, you know? And, and, and I felt the same way when I was um, lobbying. You know, if I could just do this piece of lobbying, right, I, it would be great. And of course, that's not the way it works. And it's not the way it works in law either. But yeah, as and I you would love to, I would love to do that. I think if you worked at a firm that had several lawyers and you could be brought in towards the end if the case wasn't getting resolved and then the client got to meet you and build a rapport with you because you know that's the best part of what right. I do and the other thing is is if I wasn't good at it it wouldn't be so hard to leave because right. Yeah, right. Right. I wouldn't have been where I, I mean I wouldn't have had a criminal defense firm for 17 years if I wasn't good at it people wouldn't have hired me right oh, that's very so, true yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely good at what I do that's not my problem and that actually makes it worse yeah because I know that when I leave there are going to be clients that I could have helped and that does break my heart I well, think like you said if I could live in the perfect world and in the land of and, and I worked at a firm and I wasn't yeah. a solo practitioner for 16 years, that may have been possible to just transition into that. However, being a solo practitioner, I think I would have to bring in employees, which to get to that place of only- Which gives you a whole other set of headaches. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, then, then I got more headaches. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, I always thought what would be, what would have been for me the perfect law career would have been to be an appellate lawyer. And it was something that I seriously played around with. But at the time I wanted to be a lobbyist. I only went to law school because I thought that was the best path to being a lobbyist. Oh, but, okay. once, but once I went to law school, I was like, you know what, if I could do appellate work, um, I would have done that. I st and, and who knows, maybe I would still will. I, I think well, that is, is some of the most fascinating work. Yeah, and there is plenty of people that need appellate lawyers. And I don't know yeah. what kind of work you would like to do. But, you know, before I go to trial... I typically strategize with an appellate lawyer mm, mm -hmm. so that I know how to cover the bases to make sure exactly. I set the record straight for an appeal. Because you know how many times appellate lawyers read transcripts and go, 
God, if they had just objected <laughs> or if they had just said this, it would have opened the door. Right, right. And it's too late because you're stuck with the record. Right, right. So cool. So I want to just ask as we wrap this up, if there, and you've had an interesting you know, career 17 years in, in your trial work, running your own law firm and, and practice and, and now the work that you're doing now with the horses and coaching, what are, what is like one of the big lessons that you've learned on your journey? Oh gosh, I would say there's been lots of lessons and I'm a firm believer that you are here on this earth until all your lessons have been learned. Mm. Um, so I continue to uh, develop myself in personal growth and development because I believe we all have room to grow always. The biggest, I think, think takeaway is to be in the present moment and that life really is short mm. because mm -hmm. It can be taken away at any moment. And unfortunately, so many of us live in, I'll do that someday. Yeah. And someday is not on the calendar. It's that not on the true. calendar. That is true. Yeah. That is very true. Well, Andrea. And it's just taking time to, you know, smell the roses yeah. and be present. Because I even find myself a lot of times going, I don't have time for that. I've got so much on my desk. And I go, you know what? Maybe if I just take 15 minutes, it'll shift and change. And somehow just even taking that has allowed me to get more done than it did if I had stayed at my desk or right, running away. Kind of, right, right. Yeah. It, 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 that is a, a good point. And I it, I wrote a piece back a while, it's like going slow to go faster, right? And in this, <laughs> this, this dichotomy of if we would just slow down, right? If we would just get in the moment, if we would just pay attention to what is instead of in our head, you know, doing this and, and trying to get to virus, the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this virus, if anything, has taught a lot of people that because they didn't have a yeah. choice right right and all of their stuff came firing up when they had to sit at home yeah because now they were like I can't avoid I can't go to work I can't go to the gym what am I going to do like I have to be present with my kids they need me I now I'm going to sit down and have five meals a week with my family right. instead of running to a sport, being late from a job, a client calling me because now we don't have any of that no, noise going on. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No. It, it, and you're absolutely right. Is we have to slow down and it allows us to actually do more. But I think that the goal should be to be intentional about whatever that is, right? To to stop and use the time to stop and think about what it is you really want to be doing and then do that. And so yeah. I am so happy that you made time to come and chat with us today to share a little bit about your journey, to um, share a little bit about the Gestalt equine coaching. I have placed all of Andrea's uh, contact information and her links and information about what she does. And if you're interested in getting in touch with her and checking out what she does, um, look her up and then come back and share with us what you learned <laughs> about yourself. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. It's always great to talk with you and Absolutely. Um, another person that's recovering. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I know it's coming and so that, that you're getting ready to get ready. So um, it is good. Let me tell you, it's good. I know you had a taste of it. It's good on the other side. So um, enjoy and thank you again for stopping by. Thank you. All right.